it's important to think about what we mean when we use the phrase, you know, right wing extremism. It is a, a large body of different groups with different ideologies. They tend to have some things they share in common. You know, some of them are white supremacists, some are not. What they what they tend to share in common is a belief that that big government is bad, that government has been overreaching, that civil liberties are being trampled on. Um, so they tend to often coalesce around things like um, being um, uh, pro pro gun or pro Second Amendment. Um, they they tend to be against, uh, for example, abortion. Um, they also they they are against large government. Um, they tend to be very populist uh, in their approach. You know, kind of appealing to um, white working class individuals and some of the struggles that they face. Now, I think um, I don't think the number necessarily or the proportion of people that have what we would call right wing extremist views are necessarily on the rise. I do believe that they've become more vocal and more open. I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people hid their uh, right wing extremism and their activism. There was a real fear that they might lose jobs or, you know, not be admitted into, you know, colleges or universities. And so people tended to keep the, that part of their life separate. So you might work with somebody and, and not ever know that, that they were active necessarily in, in right-wing extremist groups. Um, I think with Charlottesville, we have seen that uh, an, an emboldenment of folks that are um, right-wing extremists and they're no longer afraid to be out in the open. So I think the president's failure, President Trump's failure to condemn the folks that uh, were in Charlottesville Ville back in 2017, certainly emboldened right-wing supporters. His failure in the presidential debate to denounce the Proud Boys has um, really emboldened these groups. They're no longer so afraid unnecessarily of, um, of being out in the open about their views. Now, it'll be interesting to see if this shifts after um, President Trump leaves office on Wednesday uh, and, and whether he continues to attract uh, followers that traffic in, in, in right-wing conspiracy theories and so forth. Okay, so, so from the insurrection to the fear of riots surrounding the inauguration, so, are you saying that we, we this country got to this point in part because of who the president was or was there something else, a driving force as to how the country got to this point? Well, you know, the FBI has been concerned about right wing extremism for a number of years. Back in 2008, they published a re report that identified right wing extremists as a significant terrorist threat. Um, that is still I believe true today. Um, it's just that um, some of the some of the the failure of our leadership, and and, I, and not just President Trump, but also those those in uh, you know GOP leaders that are also seeming to align themselves with Q QAnon supporters and, and other extremist views. Their failure to condemn that I think is bringing this more out into the open. Um, and so that, that is why we have the real fears around what's going to happen at the inauguration um, on Wednesday. But I don't think that a change in leadership necessarily means the problem goes away. There, you know, I, I, I assume that President Trump is going to continue to argue that the election was stolen from him and continue to fuel that grievance. Right wing extremists basically are, are, are fueled, their ideology is fueled by grievances you know, things that have happened to them. So they point to um, the siege in Waco back when President Clinton was president, what happened to David Koresh and his followers, the Ruby Ridge incident where FBI and uh, agents killed Randy Weaver's wife. Um, these are all grievances that right-wing supporters tend to traffic in. And so President Trump's failure to win re-election is another grievance that I suspect will continue to be talked about in those circles. So I don't think the danger goes away, although perhaps the rhetoric will be turned down and the openness will be toned down a bit because we have a, a different uh, different uh, political party in power and a different president leading the country. Okay, yeah, and so since this is 
being shown after the inauguration has occurred, what should the new administration be concerned about the most regarding extremists as we move forward with a new president, new administration? Well, I think most significantly, I would say this is the number one thing. I think there are several things we can talk about, but one is, I think there's been some evidence that our law enforcement and our military have been infiltrated by right-wing extremists. Now, the military has been concerned for a number of years, for example, about you know, individuals that belong to criminal gangs, and they still are concerned about that joining the military. But right-wing extremists now have become another group that they're concerned about. Um, I would um, argue that uh, the last thing you wanna do is recruit into the military or law enforcement somebody with right wing or left wing. I would I would argue that too. Anyone with extremist views, regardless of the side of the political spectrum, and teach them how to use weapons and how to engage in warfare. But we've done exactly that. So I think that is a significant concern. I think another concern, though, is not adding to the list of grievances. You know, we live in a democracy. That means that even people with unpopular views have First Amendment rights. And so we should, we should, we should monitor these groups, we should monitor their group's activity, but let them exist to the extent that they don't violate anyone else's rights or become violent. If, you, um, if they, they, they perceive themselves to be victims and they, they constantly believe that um, they're being put down by government, they're being unnecessarily watched and surveilled. I think that surveillance needs to continue, but to be done in such a way that we don't fuel the grievance. So in other words, as long as they're following laws, as long as they're not inciting violence, you know, that, you know, they, they continue to do the, unfortunately, the work that they do. But if you, um, if you come down on them too hard and in and, and ways that aren't legal, that continues to fuel their list of grievances. So it's a very delicate balancing act. You want to you want to be you want to watch them and make sure that if any threats occur that you're prepared to deal with them um, as a government, but at the same time you don't want to push them and 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 um, encourage more people to sign on to their beliefs because they they believe they're being unjustly persecuted. So I I don't um, envy uh, I don't envy our, our leadership in trying to decide how to balance those two things. Okay. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned to with the FBI and then this with surveillance of coming down too hard on them. And we know that the FBI continues to monitor to some degree and they have warned Minnesota, they have Minnesota on its radar because of ongoing threats. And last year, um, if you can incorporate this, how the U.S. Attorney's, Attorney, Attorney's Office charged three men connected to the Boogaloo um, boys for crimes committed in Minnesota following the death of George Floyd. So, so from a state level, whether it's here in Minnesota or elsewhere, um, what concerns should there be from governors? Well, I think, um... Minnesota probably um, has been, was targeted because we have a Democratic governor in place who has been very forceful in trying to um, come up with and enforce COVID, you know, restrictions that have uh, hopefully stopped the spread or have slowed the spread of COVID-19. And Boogaloo Boys in particular um, have demonstrated at, for example, the Michigan Capitol because they were upset about COVID-19 uh, restrictions. They view those as an affront to civil liberties, to personal liberties. And so they've been very vocal about that. They also tend to um, like to demonstrate in favor of second amendment rights. I think there is a misperception um, often that extremist behavior, you know, it occurs in either rural areas or um, in the southern part of the United States or in the western part of the United States. And the Southern Poverty Law Center has documented that extremist groups exist in, in all 50 states. You know, Minnesota in particular, um, just recently, I, I live in a, a neighborhood in St. Paul that has seen, has regularly has stickers placed along University Avenue that promotes a, a white supremacist group. Um, that's local. 
um, there is a, a, a former Lutheran church um, in, a, in a town near where I grew up that has become a new gathering place for the Astatru Folk Assembly, which is a, a right-wing extremist group that has um, some religious uh, ideology as, as part, of their, um, part of their thinking. So I think these groups, um, it, it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing for Minnesota to have issues with extremist groups. The former head of the, uh, the neo-Nazis was headquartered here in Minnesota. And at one time there was a, a, a record company that produced um, white supremacist uh, music that was also headquartered here in Minnesota. Now that's not the case anymore, but if folks are thinking that, that this is new to Minnesota, it simply isn't. And we just have to continue to monitor these groups um, and keep an eye on them. And again, as long as they're engaging in, in, in legal behavior, that's one thing, but to the extent that they start to um, incite violence or are preparing to become violent, you know, we need our leadership to, um, to take the threat seriously. And, and I think that currently is going on. So I'm thankful the FBI is monitoring it. But that brings up another point, and that is that, you know, we're living in a situation where we have had agencies like the FBI um, demoralized over the past four or five years. We've had uh, national leadership that refused to listen to and take seriously intelligence reports. And I think um, both our president and the new leadership coming in needs to reestablish uh, trust with, with intelligence agencies, including the FBI. What can the general public do um, to, to either minimize or help eliminate the spread of, of extremist thought or extremist behavior? Is, is there anything at all that we can do? I think the vast majority of extremist talk, if you will, conversations that um, have, a, a, you know, that that contain elements of extremist, you know, ideology, that's very commonplace, and it takes place between persons, either face to face or on social media. And I think the best thing we can do is when we hear this kind of talk, whether it be a a QAnon conspiracy theory. Um, or racist jokes or racist language, I think uh, we have an obligation to speak up and say, you know, that's not right, um, that's offensive. And to the extent that we're silent because we're uncomfortable, that signifies acceptance, even if that's not what we're trying to, what we're trying to signal. Complicity, silence is complicity. And so we have, I think the biggest thing we can do is have conversations and, and I heard, you know, I heard someone talking about this in terms of Martin Luther King Day. What can white people do? This isn't, uh, this isn't, the, white supremacy is a, is a problem of white people. It is something that white people do and white people say. And we need white people to stand up and say, this isn't right, um, that this isn't true. These, these aren't facts, they're your opinions and these opinions are harmful and, and to call it out for what it is, it's offensive. Um, and I think when we start doing that, we may in fact, you know, see a turn where at the very least people will understand um, this, isn't, this isn't something, I can't be open and vocal about this. And I think that's a good thing. I, um, if people are, we need to get back to the point where people were afraid to, um, to be publicly known as a member of a extremist group. And unfortunately today we're, we're not in that situation. So our, our talking back is I think the best thing we can do to counter this kind of thinking. 